Good afternoon. My name is John Lindahl. I'd like to welcome you to the Nebraska State Historical Society's Brown Bag Lecture Series held here at the Nebraska History Museum on the third Thursday of every month. A detailed schedule for this series as well as information about all the Historical Society's programs and services can be found on our website, which is nebraskahistory.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for funding the filming of these lectures. Their financial support allows us to tape and broadcast these programs on public access television. We have a treat today. Our speaker is Kenneth Bay, who is head of Paintings Conservation at the Nebraska State Historical Society's Gerald R. Ford Conservation Center, which is located in Omaha. His topic is the conservation of Grant Wood's corn room murals at the Gerald R. Ford Conservation Center. Please welcome Kenneth Bay. Thank you very much. What I have to tell you today is a very interesting story, and it's still in progress. It's work in progress, and it concerns um, very poorly known mural paintings by one of America's best known and best loved artists, Grant Wood. Grant Wood, of course, in that other state, Iowa, which is somewhere across um, a river that's on the other side of Nebraska. But a place that I've become very fond of because of my relationship with the Bluffs Arts Council, which has overseen this project and in fact is the um, custodian of these works of art. And um, we have here the president of the Bluffs Arts Council, Dick Miller, has kindly come down for this talk. And so perhaps if there are other questions that he can answer at the end, I might turn to um, Dick. He's also brought a little bit of um, some didactic displays related to this project. Um, the Gerald Ford Conservation Center has had paper and objects and sometimes textile conservation for many years, since 1995, 1996. But I came in just, uh, just a little bit under a year and a half ago as a new hired position to start the Paintings Conservation Lab with generosity from the, um, uh, um, an endowment from the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation and generous funding to start up the lab for the Peter Kiewit um, Foundation. Um, Grant Wood's corn room murals is the discussion I'll have today of 1927 and they were painted for what we now know as the Chieftain Hotel, which was opened in 1927 in Council Bluffs. That building is no longer called the Chieftain Hotel. It's a, um, an apartment dwelling called Bluffs Towers, but it still stands on the northeast corner of um, the main square park called Bayless Park in Council Bluffs. Um, the project began, and if you look in the center of this section of the mural, the project began, um, uh, it says Chief, Hotel Chieftain up there, um, with this painting, which has all along belonged to the Bluffs Arts Council. And what you'll learn in this project, this is the story of um, an expansive mural, first painted, up for many years, seen by many people, and then um, indignantly and summarily destroyed and torn apart in 1970, as recent as 1970, uh, to make way for interior renovation of the building into low-income senior housing, government-sponsored housing, um, what is what it has become today. So fragments have been around for all that time since, and this fragment belonged to the Bluffs Arts Council and was the only known piece for a long time to them. But then um, in uh, 2007, I believe it was, Dick Miller received several more fragments that came in anonymously from a source where they had been rolled up and stored in an attic for the better part of 39 years. And these are more fragments of the corn room. They're about eight feet tall and two to three feet wide. And they're temporarily, in these pictures, you see them temporarily bandaged with Japanese tissue facings to protect areas of flaking. That was done by the Ford Conservation Center just before I came on board as a staff member, and that's just to stabilize the paintings. Um, they were crumpled up, rolled up, folded, and squashed, and here you see them laid out on tables. Grant Wood was born in, 19, in 1891, February 13th, 
and died in 1941, just shy of his 51st birthday um, on February 12th of liver cancer. A self-portrait and a uh, wonderful photograph of him. Um, we don't know, we don't think so much about his early career, but he studied um, many different parts, forms of art, carpentry, woodwork, metalwork, design, and um, attended the art school in Chicago. And um, shortly after that, made several trips to Paris, at least these two trips, 1920, 1923, where he came under the, uh, the spell and influence of impressionist, post-impressionist paintings, and most importantly, fell in love with painting outdoors, what we call plain air painting. Um, Grant Wood on the lower left, painting plain air painting. Um, Claude Monet in a painting by Renoir, painting outdoors, um, several decades earlier. And um, it's, we think of Monet and, 19th, and Impressionism as strictly 19th century, but in fact, Monet died in the um, early 20th century and was, um, these pictures would have been fairly current at the time when Grant Wood would have arrived in Paris. And that they, of course, were um, painted with, largely from inspiration from outdoor painting, although Monet painted in a studio very close to his garden at Giverny. Um, the paintings of Edouard Vuillard, the type of modern um, uh, post-impressionist painting that he would have encountered in the 20s when he arrived in Paris, and Grant Wood's paintings of this period, very um, brushy, impressionistic, uh, uh, free-flowing style. And then landscapes he would have painted in Europe at the time, scenes that are quite impressionistic in their brushstroke. But um, alas, by 1926, Grant Wood, on his second trip, um, came to a sudden realization that um, he was kind of fed up with what he called the, the neo-meditationalists, his word, the people who would sit around um, in the bars and cafes in Paris um, drinking, of course, and with um, waiting for a good idea or artistic inspiration to just hit them in the head. And at that moment, he said, you know, I realized that it, it was all the good ideas I ever had were back in Iowa when I was milking a cow. <laughs> and so he returns and never comes back to France again. Um, he does make one more trip to Europe, which you'll hear about um, at the end. And here's Grant Wood in his studio in Cedar Rapids. He had been born in Anamosa, but then moved with his mother and sisters down um, the road to Cedar Rapids shortly after his father died. And he remained a painter and a teacher in Cedar Rapids uh, for the rest of his career, a painting in his self-built design studio, Turner Alley, which, by the way, is open as part of the Cedar Rapids Art, um, um, Art Center and can be visited. And um, so his paintings actually were painted indoors. This is the Metropolitan's famous Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. Paintings of 1927, because we're focusing on this year, um, would have, um, he was immediately turning around, looking around at the Iowa countryside, inspired by um, these corn um, um, shocks, and you know, you can almost compare them to Monet's series of water of, of haystacks at the same time. Um, but note the very brushy painting. Um, his interest in the corn shocks as a motif, as something which occurs with a regular pattern in landscape, became an ideal source for him to develop his later, more precise um, geometric compositions, these idealistic farm scenes. And um, this is 1931, um, 1941. And finally, a very late painting completed just before his death at the Cleveland Museum currently, a painting that I actually I got to know quite intimately because I was a conservator there for um, 18 years before I came to Nebraska, um, showing uh, this desolate scene of geometrically arranged corn shocks with rabbit foot tracks um, actually leaving and never entering again, but wandering through the landscape. 
quite poignant because we know that when he, um, when he was young and lost his father, they were so poor at one point, they would go out hunting and they would shoot rabbits uh, for part of their uh, to, for nourishment at the time. So he turns back to the rabbit motif at the end of his life. Now, Council Bluffs in, um, in the 1920s, you have to think of Council Bluffs before the Depression years, boon years for, the, for this city. Um, magnificent buildings and streets, and um, this is an old postcard on the uh, right, and that is the Bluffs Towers today, but the Chieftain Hotel back in 1927. Um, it's one of a series of hotels opened by a magnate, Eugene Epley, after whom the airport in Omaha is named, and he opened up three major hotels that year, the Chieftain Hotel, Council Bluffs, the Hotel Montrose in Cedar Rapids. And here I just give you a preview glimpse of a corn room. That room down here um, on the lower left contains um, sections of murals framed separately, shown in one room in all four sides, um, and a small detail from a surviving fragment of that, of that room. Um, all Parts of all the paintings of what we know as the corn rooms, there were three corn rooms, survive. You'll learn most about the ones in Council Bluffs. The Cedar Rapids corn room fragments survive as fragments in storage currently at the Cedar Rapids Art Center. And then there are fragments also in Sioux City. This is the third hotel opened that year, the Hotel Martin in Sioux City, also 1927, and more about the corn room later. The Montrose and Martin Hotel buildings no longer exist. They were torn down. The um, Bluffs Arts, the uh, Bluffs Towers, known as the Chieftain Hotel in 1927, still survives externally as a building structure. Here are some views of sort of original parts of the old Chieftain Hotel. Um, part of the entry lobby, magnificent stucco work up at the ceiling, uh, three graces. Um, in one of the rooms downstairs. Um, upstairs, uh, part of the ballroom survives, and we even have some original dishes and silverware that's clearly marked for the uh, Chieftain Hotel. If you want to see this plate and this fork, it's in the back of this room, so you can see a relic for yourselves. Uh, the corn room was a magnificent 30 by 18 foot reception space designed on the second floor. If you go there today, it's just above Godfather Pizza. And um, it was a room, if you could turn this into Technicolor and imagine, it was all the colors of um, the blue sky and the green and yellow fields of corn and the rolling hills of Iowa landscape. I say Iowa, but it doesn't look too different from, as, as an East Coasterner, Iowa, Nebraska, it all looks alike to me in a way. Um, but but the, the, the corn does grow taller in, in Iowa, I can tell you that for sure. Um, and that's a complete, 360 degrees around you, a complete wraparound mural um, uh, uh, decorative set. And you can see just glimpses of that. In this, the best known surviving photograph of the corn room um, taken back in the um, probably the 1950s or 40s. And um, notice the chandeliers at the top. Those are um, um, also designed and made by Grant Wood. Remember, he was a metal worker in um, his early years. And we have two chandeliers that survive from this time. Uh, this one is in the Cedar Rapids Art Center. This one came on the market pr um, privately in um, recent months and was restored back to its original all gilt appearance. And on the left hand side I show you an example of jewelry work by Grant Wood. Um, the corn cob chandeliers of Council Bluffs, all three of them from that room have disappeared. Uh, we don't know when they were taken out of the room and um, there are rumors that parts of it were taken apart and maybe even put onto the finials of people's front gate fences of their lawns. We just don't know. If you ever spot anything that looks like that corn cob in, around Omaha or Council Bluffs, let me know. Um, other photographs we have, while we acknowledge that they are group photos, and I 
off, really wish that those women would have stood aside for this photograph so I could have had a better view. But nonetheless, every single piece of evidence, every photograph, and we have been making calls out to people who've, who have family photos of the, of the um, corn room, every photo provides a little shred of information that becomes useful for me um, and the Bluffs Arts Council in our reconstruction of the room. Um, notice at the top there's lettering and words written and to see that, to see the upper three feet, one actually has to literally crawl up through the false drop ceiling into this space and crawl very carefully along the metal strips um, so you don't fall through into someone's apartment. Remember there's senior housing down below and we find bits of um, corn room up above including the worded uh, freeze up at the top, and more on that in just a moment. We have, um, you see that round, um, elaborate uh, base for the chandelier attachment, and that in fact corresponds to the one you see in the photograph. Um, we drew up a, a quick pencil sketch floor plan of the corn room and the adjacent rooms, a foyer, a Beaux-Arts room, and what we call the pioneer room. And we can do this by walking along, uh, as I say, I, I don't know the floor plan as well as I know the ceiling plan of the, counts of the, of the corn room from, from standing right below it and putting my finger on it. And you can see the divisions between the rooms. The, um, um, the pioneer room is another decorated mural room by Grand Wood. And we'll see that. I mentioned there are letters um, stenciled along the top. And if you follow along, it's the unofficial state song of Iowa. Iowa, Iowa, um, the state of all the land. Uh, we are from uh, Iowa where the tall corn grows or something like this. I can't, I can't sing the melody for you. I, I don't know that. But um, we can see all of that written out twice around the perimeter of the ceiling freeze, except that about 50% of it has been completely demolished and destroyed. In what happened was the room, and you'll see in a moment how far it was altered after it was demolished. Um, the Pioneer Room murals are another story. These tell the early, story of the early days of Council Bluffs, all painted by Grand Wood and also removed in a hurry at the demolition of the interior of the hotel in 1970. And um, they were saved at the 11th hour, literally the night before the room was torn apart by Dr. Milton Heifetz, a uh, brain surgeon from um, Los Angeles, an, um, an arts uh, lover, um, relative of the violinist Yasha Heifetz, brought these to Cal California and then soon after returned all of his murals uh, back to this part of the country. The, um, uh, the, the ones you see here are installed, were, were donated back to Grant Wood's old high school where he taught also, at Washington High School in Cedar Rapids. And that's the display you see. And the other mural is the, um, the, um, the view of old Canesville, Canesville being the old name for Council Bluffs. And that's at uh, Iowa Western Community College, hanging in Loft Hall. Um, Grant Wood was uh, reported uh, to, to, said to a reporter um, around the time he was painting this that um, of his inspiration, this was painted after a painting by George Simon, an old um, view of Council Bluffs. He said, there was a wealth of historic paintings for me to choose from. I believe that Council Bluffs is richer in historic works of art than any other Midwestern city. And he loved his time in Council Bluffs. He found the people cultivated, interested in what he was doing, and they seemed to understand his art. Unlike, we believe, his opinions of the people up in that other city, uh, Sioux City. Um, the red line shows the um, the, 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 the former location of the corn room and the current floor plan shows you how it was all subdivided into apartments after the ceiling was demolished and lowered down. It's completely different. You have no idea that there was once this magnificent room in there. Um, and we can actually 
Um, and these are some of the fragments I showed you at the beginning, the Phyllis, the, uh, the auto fragments. And we can, I can tell from um, just glimpsing at the photographs, uh, the historic photographs on the right-hand side, where these two murals belong. They actually uh, were at 90 degrees to each other in the corner of the room. And they went all the way up to the top of the ceiling, just up to the frieze of letters. So I have to look below the ceiling. And this is like this is one of these apartments currently in the hotel. Um, and I can look at the wall where it was and up at the ceiling part where the upper part of it was before the ceiling was put in place. And furthermore, do you see the window on the left side of the vintage photograph shows that Grant would continued his decorative scheme into the window niches on the sides. And in fact, um, this fragment has come in from, um, has been brought to our attention that's up in a town in uh, Algona in northern Iowa. And just from looking at the details, I can pin that down to that particular window niche. So gradually, it becomes a room in my mind, in my imagination, that I can close my eyes and almost walk around and see where every painting is. Um, other photographs, this one is from the Omaha World Herald of the 1950s, and um, this large fragment, I can tell, was just to the right of a doorway and went right into the corner of the room, and in fact belongs in that corner of the room to just the right of the door lintel, in the, where the arrow points. And then um, back to this little sketch, the, um, a much better image of that entire north wall of the, um, of the corn room is traceable to that entire wall um, that you see where the arrow points. We have two good images of that room, too. So as I said, it's a room which, which one becomes familiar with through not only the fragments and the parts of it that survive, but also the, um, the, uh, the, f the old photographs we have, which helps place the exact um, locations and context for different fragments. Um, Back in uh, January of 08, just shortly after I arrived at the Ford Center and had been handed these um, three mural fragments that came from the Bluffs Arts Council, I made a trip back east and stopped through Anamosa, where I had gotten some indication there were other fragments. And in the Arts Center, which is a local um, uh, designed for tourists information center about Grand Wood, they had these large fragments on view, original Grant Wood material alongside with uh, didactic displays and reproductions of his paintings. And in fact, they come from the corn room of Council Bluffs. And through um, determination and a great deal of diplomacy on part of the Bluffs Arts Council, they um, got in touch with the owner who was very generous and very understanding of the entire project and understood immediately that these had to come back to join with the rest of the murals and be part of this, of this endeavor to reconstruct the room. And so these are what we call Ernie Burrish's murals. Um, Burrish, wonderful man. He knew Grant Wood's sister, who's the woman in American Gothic quite well. And in fact, when she died in her 90s, um, she had so much respect for him that she turned over her um, royalty rights to Ernie so that every time that painting is reproduced and you have to pay a fee to the Art Institute of Chicago, the royalties go to Ernie and he then turns it over to charity. And this is the other fragment and you can see it got severely water damaged and is flaky. This photograph, which shows a lot of flaking, is quite benign and harmless looking compared to seeing the picture in reality. In reality, if I just blow on the paint, some of it falls off the picture. And we can trace those burrish murals to the uh, southwest corner of the room from this Peterson photograph, which I've been showing you over and over again. We know that they, just like the other murals, stood at right angles to each other on the wall. And uh, just for perspective, the uh, wall on the right-hand side is this gentleman's um, bare uh, wall of his kitchenette in the senior housing that once housed the, uh, the um, I'm sorry, it's the wall that's on the left arrow that's this wall here in his apartment. Kind of funny to go into his apartment and he's watching television and I'm saying, I'm coming in because I want to see, I want to imagine where the corn room murals were at one time. 
Um, other sources came in, for example, from U.S. Bank, which houses about four fragments in their uh, vault. That's because banks, which they took over from, um, and um, <clears throat> were original banks from Council Bluffs that housed some of these in their vaults. And so these collections ended up actually on the Omaha side of the river. Um, another fragment. And you can see that um, it's wonderful, these are wonderful compositions in their own right, but they were never conceived that way by Grant Wood. What we have here are appealing cutout vignettes which um, um, appeal to some people who were taking out fragments at the last moment before the mural was completely destroyed and getting just uh, suitable frameable compositions that they could take for themselves. Those first fragments that I showed you that are tall and vertical and eight feet tall from top to bottom are unusual in that pictorially they're not particularly interesting, but they tell me a lot of valuable information about the configuration of these. I have to say, I think that US Bank got some of the best fragments. <laughs> And we can trace that one to the north wall, right at the center of the picture, cut out. And these old photographs are tantalizing in that they, they, um, um, they indicate to us how much we're missing. We would love to have a little piece of that signpost and more of that con corn shock on the left. And every time a new fragment comes to light, I quickly compare it to the blanks, the, the sections where we don't have fragments represented to see if I can help fill in the blank. Um, here again is the Bluffs Arts Council's original fragment that started off this, the interest in this project. And then um, here is a fragment from a private collector in, um, in Council Bluffs. I should say something briefly about these private collectors. Many of them purchased fragments at auctions and at sales um, after the um, fragments were taken out of the room. Others came into people's hands quite by... Um, by chance, and because I guess there was l lack of supervision at the time, and so people ended up kind of walking off with free sections. And um, today, due to a call from the Bluffs Arts Council, a lot of fragments have been donated back, or at least permanently loaned back, or uh, owners cooperating to pr provide um, access to their paintings for photography and images. Um, the Bluffs Arts Council fragment on the lower right, this privately owned fragment here, and one of the U.S. Bank fragments can also be placed on the large uninterrupted um, west wall. The west wall is, the west and the north walls are the two walls that are not broken or are interrupted by window niches, and so they stand as complete expansive landscape scenery. It was said uh, by diners and people who held meetings here in this room that um, the illusion was so perfect, it was like entering Iowa rolling corn countryside on a late afternoon, early evening, golden sunlight, and that visitors felt they could just lean back with a chair and pick an ear of corn and munch away on it during their meeting. Um, and um, you'll notice in some of these images dark, dirty bands running through the lower third of the pictures. Those correspond to the locations of wooden chair rails. And the chair rails were mounted into the walls exactly at the right position so that they passed through the painted holes of the painted fence posts. So the illusion was perfect. It prevented the chairs from crashing into the wall, but it also had this rustic look, um, which you'll see. Some fragments I have are just fragments of fragments, or what I call fragments missing fragments, like this L-shaped piece here. No doubt it contained a very um, um, appealing, attractive composition, which is now missing. So I will treat this picture as a, what do we call a lining, so that I will at any time be able to add the missing part in the future, or the Bluffs Arts Council can do that. Um, another very badly flaking section on the right, which was stored in the man's wine cellar for many years. And when he learned about the project, he went down to the wine cellar to find it, to give it back, and said, oh, sorry, it's, it's, it's flaking. And then these odd fragments, all in one private collection, represent um, 
just miscellaneous little pieces, anything that people could get their hands on. So the one in the top center is really quite insignificant in itself, except that you know it comes from the corn room. We have a pumpkin. Um, Grant Wood even commented on the stupidity of people in, Count in Sioux City who thought he was only painting pumpkins because they were going to use the room someday as a, as a Halloween party center uh, once a year. And he said, you know, it's because I love pumpkins. I want to conclude them in my, in, my, in, my, in my compositions. He said, those people in that other city, they don't understand me, but the people of Council Bluffs are sophisticated, smart, cultivated, and understanding. And he loved his time down there. Um, by the way, the only mention I can make of Nebraska in this entire lecture, and I realize with, um, with some awkwardness that I am speaking for the NSHS talk series, so it should be Nebraska, but we know from first-hand accounts from his sister Nan that he loved coming to Omaha quite regularly to the Hotel Fontenelle, another Eugene Epley-owned hotel, because he particularly loved the chef's preparation of bear meat. So that's, that's Nebraska. Um, and these window niches, I told you, I, I showed you the one already on the left-hand side and how that was placed to um, the left of that group of women who were standing in the room in the southeast corner of the room. But that's yet another window niche. And we know there will probably be more of these turning up because if you count the rooms, there's, a, but there's about 10 windows. So there's about, there's got to be, have, have been about 20 of these altogether. Um, and another odd fragment that came to light at the US Bank was just the cutout signature of Grant Wood and his assistant, Edgar Britton, 1927. So it's, it's, first, it's only about six by eight inches. It's, you just want to take it home with you in your pocketbook. Um, here again are the, um, the, what, the auto fragments, which first came when the project was begun. And I want to show you just a few um, examples of details, because I think, uh, you know, I can talk and talk about the history, but I think really the pictures tell so much for themselves if you, if you have a chance to look up close. I, I'm comparing uh, a full composition still life that he painted in around 1927, 28, at the same time that he was painting the corn room murals, finishing them up. Um, you can see very similar um, brushy paint, sometimes flowing, quite impressionistic and very different with what we associate with as Grant Wood's um, mature style. So these are sort of up from about six inches away details that I've taken that just give you impression of the, the very loose brushwork. And I should tell you that the paintings survive in beautiful condition, even though they're fragmentary. Uh, many of the corn room mural fragments in Council Bluffs Although the room was destroyed and some of them were torn apart and water damaged and cut apart, um, those fragments on the whole survive in better condition than the fragments from the other two hotels that we um, can find in the museums. Pumpkin. Um, so just, just a second to feast your eyes. I can sometimes see traces of the drawing that he did to begin the compositions. Um, in other parts, I can see clearly that he began and finished off the, comp the full composition of these uh, mural sections that were about three feet wide strips. And then they were rolled up, shipped to um, location, in this case, Council Bluffs, mounted on the wall. And in about a two and a half week period, he finished off all the rest of the work, uh, adding more touches with his assistant. Again, this is what I would see. I, I come to work every day, and I get to see this from six inches away. And I get paid for it, too, to be able to look at these beautiful images. It has almost uh, an Asian kind of a calligraphic uh, style like you would find in Japanese painting of the time, which, you know, in detail it looks this way, but it wouldn't be too far off to imagine that this was a time that still came under the spell of um, Orientalism in art. So 
So the Painting Conservation Lab at the um, Gerald Ford Center, which is located just off of Hanscom Park up in, um, in, um, in Omaha, uh, a place that would not exist had Richard Nixon not gotten involved in Watergate, and therefore um, Ford wouldn't have become president, and I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> so um, it was a la um, uh, it's, a, it's a generous space in which I, many paintings can be treated um, simultaneously, and you see the corn room murals down here on the lower right. A view from the other direction. It's about 20 feet tall, 30 feet by 40 feet. Not too different than the corn room itself. And we have specialized equipment, for example, infrared reflectography, which allows one to peer, um, in the case of the painting and the detail in the upper right, peer through the paint under certain um, correct circumstances. You can see the underdrawing or the, the, the handwriting below the paint. That's a special imagery. Um, brand new standing microscope, binocular stereo microscope, which allows us to look through but also um, document and show off what we're seeing on a live image on the computer screen at the same time. Treatments are done um, according to the problems we have on hand with the painting and broken down generally structural, meaning um, the paint itself, the canvas, is it stable, does it need attention to um, stabilize it? And in fact, it does. We have the fragment of um, the, what we call the Piper fragment, the one that was left in the wine cellar, is so flaky that if you just stand it up, pieces just rain down to the floor. So that's kept flat. And the schematic illustration shows um, can, uh, little islands of paint just cleaving off the uh, canvas in a similar way. And the treatment for that is to consolidate with carefully chosen consolidants, often thermoplastic in nature, just so that they can activate, reactivate at a certain temperature. So we can use the, um, the moisture in the adhesive to relax it, and then heat and pressure to then bring the paint down into plane and to get it to set. This is a, a rolled up piece. This was brought to my attention in a garbage bag out of someone's house, and it's the L-shaped piece you saw earlier in the, in, the, in the piece. And you can see, this was when it was first shown to me, just little pieces of grand wood lying all over the table up there, the consolidant. And um, this is, these are the kinds of heating tools I use, the uh, little heating iron with different heat tips. Of course, everything's made in Germany and Switzerland because they're the best at making these accurate tools, and then the heat air gun, uh, hot air gun on the lower right, which is, I call it a cross between a cigarette lighter and a hair dryer. It can set a painting on fire. Um, a special suction um, a platter um, surface that with mylar over it and a vacuum down below draws down a vacuum to help stabilize that picture. This is the kind of folding and crumpling I find from paintings having been um, squashed up in people's attics for a long time. This is a piece of the corn room Grant Wood mural of the auto fragments. And this is the kind of procedure where we um, line them or at least flatten them with moisture and heat on a, uh, under a vacuum fill, um, mylar uh, film on a hot, uh, hot suction table. Specialized equipment that was brought in um, to the lab for this treatment for not just Grant Woods, but for any paintings that come to us. Um, treatments of um, holes, hole repairs, mending. Um, reinforcing of edges or mounting edges so that the pieces which were once on a wall can now be placed, in this case, on wooden stretchers so that they're mobile, they can be moved around, um, and more about that in a moment, about the display of these murals. And then, um, finally, cleaning. These murals are not heavily varnished at all uh, with any traditional varnish that we, are, we usually associate with paintings, but they do have very high, heavy levels of dark uh, gray grime, which disfigures, darkens the paintings. And um, in fact, yes, this, these pictures actually were taken fairly recently. You can see the, um, the, 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 the mural on the left has been half cleaned, and you can see a light and a dark section in the sky. Again, these digital pictures really don't give justice to what you actually see up, up in person. But believe me, there is cleaning going on. Um, remember that I was telling you about these horizontal bands? About one third of the way up from the picture is 
the band, which if you imagine the mural standing above the um, floorboard and then reaching up about three and a half feet, um, there's the uh, position of the wooden chair rail that passed through the fence post. And through many washings of dirt and grime and candle soot and smoke that was on the pictures, water washed dirt behind those, um, those wooden chair rails and left those dark, dirty marks. And in fact, those can be cleaned somewhat successfully um, to match more or less the rest of the mural. So they will be cleaned. There's the image on the lower right and detail of cleaning in the sky. Cleaning, by the way, um, just in general, it's a touchy issue because it's sometimes necessary to achieve the uh, original appearance of the picture closer. Um, however, we do have discolorations from old coatings that Grant would put on. And not all the murals come to us completely untreated. Some of the fragments have found their way to conservation or re restoration labs previously and were heavily treated. Um, even to the point of ruin, where some of the coatings that were Grant Wood's originals and very, very hard to remove have been um, abraded off along with the top layers of paint. And so we have a number of fragments which come to us in very badly abraded appearance. And that's a, that's a challenge uh, to deal with, too. In fact, there's no treatment for that. These pictures, in, in that sense, have been ruined. Um, but in painting can be accomplished with pigments and the correct media to uh, address paint losses. Um, color, light, uh, light balanced uh, lights that are used, used for in painting. Um, and finally, um, attention to how these will be cared for in the future. How we'll find the right environment, the right setting, the right uh, display for these. Um, I'm going to turn your attention now to the other third set of murals, which are the corn room murals of Sioux City. These murals had been um, uh, lost a long time ago under a layer of wallpaper. And when that hotel was about to be destroyed, um, someone with memory uh, notified and said, you know, there are corn room murals up there. They're just below the wallpaper. And they have, in fact, they've been very badly damaged by the adhesives and by all the scraping that went on to remove it. And um, they're, they really are this yellow and this sort of featureless. All the original painted detail has been more or less obliterated from these. But they're beautifully displayed in the Sioux City Art Center, a very well-funded place, and you can see beautiful wooden frames, a room exclusively for displaying these fragments here with wonderful didactic labels that talk about the history of these murals. So um, a goal would be for the Sioux City, for the Council Bluffs, um, Bluffs Arts Council to maybe also go in this direction. Um, and Dick, who's here, could tell us more about those plans if you want to ask questions after this talk. Um, so what I have here is a story of um, many fragments, many pieces of Humpty Dumpty that have to be put back together again, many pieces missing, and uh, worst of all, many fragments in many different states of condition. So we're treating every piece individually, but with a mind towards displaying the whole eventually. And I have no answers at this point on what will become of these in terms of their permanent display, because that's all work in progress right now, and that's the work of the Bluffs Arts Council. Um, but it has been getting tremendous publicity. It got a series of um, almost nine months in the news of the Omaha World Herald and particularly the um, daily nonpareil of, um, of Council Bluffs, which actually is owned by the World Herald. Um, just two little other facts I've got to show you. I found where Grant Wood slept. You know, we all know where George Washington slept, where GW slept. Well, my GW is Grant Wood, and he slept in the basement, currently where the furnace is of the hotel. We know his bed was down beside there, and at night he came down and he cleaned off his brushes. And we have exactly the same palette of the, of the leftover paint on the wall. And someone in 1941 named Hugh, by the way, um, uh, just wrote his name on top. So we know at least that these predate 1941 and most likely I think they date from 1927 when he was living in the hotel for several weeks. Another um, uh, anecdote that's come to us is that his payment for these uh, was $35 a week and all the whiskey he could consume. Um, after 
1927, by 1928, he was on to another commission. This was a two-year um, stained glass window commission for um, the only stained glass he made, which is in um, um, Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Actually, it was, it was damaged in the flooding um, two years ago and is currently you know, under restoration um, in Davenport, I believe. But um, off he was again to Europe the following year and working on, um, to supervise glass workers in Munich. And while he was in Munich, he came under the spell of another school of painting, the um, Flemish and early German old masters like Hans Memling and Albrecht Dürer. And in particular, came under the spell of a, of a, of a style painting that we call the Neue Sachlichkeit, the, uh, the uh, new ob objectivity. And from this, when he returns, he turns away permanently from his soft-edged, brushy, impressionistic style to this new hard-edged realism that helps with his anecdotal narrative storytelling um, theme in his paintings. And by 1930, just three years after the Corn Room, he paints this painting for which he won uh, first prize at the Art Institute of Chicago and won the, uh, the reward of having it purchased by the Art Institute for its collection for $300. So thank you very much uh, for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer some questions if you have any. Yes? You described your job as a detective and also as a wonderfully skilled technician. Is there also a part of the job that has you painting on top? of Grant Wood's paint? Well, I showed very quickly and humbly, I suppose, a picture of a palette with brush, with pigments and, and, and so forth. In fact, yes, I'm always in painting inside losses. That's part of my job. I'm, I'm retouching, and in a sense, I have to disappear completely. You don't want to look at any painting and say, there's Kenneth Bay uh, inside that little speck of paint, because it has to be completely disguised. It's the ultimate trompe l'oeil, in a sense. So. You've done research to look at his brushstrokes then? Yes. I mean, one can, you can imitate everything exactly, the media, the pigments, and so forth. The aim is to disguise and to use materials that are reversible. So in fact, our materials are not uh, um, synthetic alkyds, which he actually used for these murals. And we don't use oil paint, but we use pigments that can mimic the look of original artist paint, but are easily dissolvable and removable in the future. Yes. Yes, please. You mentioned his uh, payment of uh, so many dollars a week and all the whiskey he could drink. Was he a heavy drinker? <laughs> um, maybe Dick could answer this yeah. question, because he, I, I, I don't know. I remember that uh, in 27 we had prohibition, and uh, getting the whiskey was, very, <laughs> was a problem. Uh, bringing in. He wasn't so much a heavy drinker. When he did his next famous painting, the, uh, which is used on the back of the Iowa Porter, uh, called Arbor Day, uh, he, would take a, he would take a jug of whiskey and uh, have someone drive out and he would just tour the countryside until he found the perfect house or something that he wanted, which he did in Eldon, Iowa when he did the American Gothic. And just a small correction with Ken, uh, this painting was won the third prize in the Chicago. Oh, not even the first prize. This is a third prize painting you're looking at. It's a third prize, and yes. the thing it is, the, the second prize was won by Mr. Dubois, and the first prize was won by Louis Rittman, who did a one called Julian. And uh, according to the uh, Mr. Beale, who did a, a complete story on the American Gothic, is that one of the trustees, this was not even in third place, but that he came up and, and viewed it with the judge, and he said, why isn't it, well, you didn't judge this? And the judge called it a comic valentine. <laughs> and he said, and he argued for it, and he finally said, yes, okay, well, we'll give it a third place rating. And that story was never told until 1950. And in 1950, they wanted to send American Gothic over to Russia, and the trustee came aboard, and he told the story, he said, I think the Russians would destroy this mon monumental painting. And so, yeah, like he said, he, and he purchased the painting himself for $300 and sold it back to the Art Institute the next day. Mm -hmm. So he always had the claim that oh. he owned that painting for a few hours. <laughs> oh. 
Incidentally, when you see this painting in the, um, in the Art Institute, you have to stand in line to, to look at it without all the people posing for their pictures next to it all the time. It's one of the most looked at and parodied pictures in the world next to the Mona Lisa, of course. Um, and the man on the right was his dentist, and that's his sister Nan on the left. And I think she wasn't too happy with her portrayal in this picture. Um, for the record, the corn room murals have zero paintings or an of people or animals in them. I think there might be a tractor in one corner, but a couple barns and churches. Um, and, and by the way, um, in all fairness to Nebraska, I think the corn grows equally well on both sides of the river. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Yes? The, the canvas, was it one big piece? No. Um, these are rolls of about th they're three feet wide at maximum. And they're just laid from top to bottom like wallpaper. It brought in sections. And, you, and that, this is exactly why, this is a very important point. They were just put on with rabbit skin glue. And easily in uh, the evening of um, 1970, when the building was about to be destroyed, people could come in and just pull very gently off without damaging the paintings, just pull them right off the wall with the brittle adhesive giving way. But the, uh, the people in charge of um, changing, renovating the hotel, the new owners, they actually had a mind to, to, um, to save these murals. And they contacted the Jocelyn and the Nelson Atkins Museum. And so-called experts there said, you know, you'll never get them off the wall. It'll be at least $100,000 of work in 1970 to get these off the wall. So don't even bother. And it was, it was that wrong, that bit of misinformation that led to them saying, OK, well, let's just put a call out to the public. Anyone who wants a piece of the, the wood, the Grand Wood Mural, come and take what you can, because we have to save it. And so it's a lesson, it's an important lesson that you can't, you can't undo history like that once it's been torn apart and um, they, they lost these murals. As I said, some fragments are probably certainly lost forever. But we have, oh, by the way, we have about 25 or so have come to our attention, either that we, that, that, that are maybe about 15 fragments in the holdings of the Bluffs Arts Council and um, eight of those are at the Gerald Ford Center for Treatment and about 10 more of them. We know who has what, um, and we have some photographs, but we haven't had access or um, a chance to have them. Some of the pieces will be loaned for a uh, temporary display. You have a small piece of the Pioneer Room and a small piece of the corn room that Ken and I took off when we were up in the ceiling up there for display. I, I crawled, risking my life above the ceiling, and I dirtied my white sneakers just to get some of those fragments that are over there. Um, Yes. But uh, good point. Uh, excuse me. When you were talking about the fragments and how it could be taken off with just a knife with rabbit glue, Dr. Milton Heifetz came in and then took a paint scraper and took all the rest of the murals off. And he jokingly said he's going to rebuild the hotel $99,998 because the paint scraper only cost him $2 to take off the murals. <laughs> yes. Yes. I have a corn song, his inspiration, or were the words on the wall an afterthought after the murals? No, that was very much the, um, the motif that was intended. And in fact, the hotel in the fo photograph of the hotel in Cedar Rapids shows that same motif. Not as large a room, so he didn't repeat the words twice all the way around. Well, thank you very much again for your kind attention today. Thank you.